Good morning, everyone. It certainly is good to be together with one another. Even though we are separated by some distance, being able to gather together is always such a great blessing to just remember the Lord and to sing songs of praises, to offer up our prayers to Him, and then, of course, to spend some time looking at His, his Word. I tell you, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and verse 24 and 25, takes on a completely different light when we find ourselves going through these periods of isolation and social distancing. When it says, you know, let's consider how to stick one another to love and to good deeds, not forsaking ourselves together as some are accustomed to, but encouraging one another even more as we see the day approaching. And so the assembly is so important to us. But these moments like we're having now certainly does, does emphasize that and causes us to have much joy in being able to be together. And though we are separated by some distance, being, being able to be united in the spirit of worshiping the Lord is an incredible blessing to us. And as I've or, has already been echoed by John, I too miss the hugs and the handshakes and, and the smiles and just being able to be close together with one another and to hear one another's voices and to just to rejoice in one another's presence. So it's a great thing. So let me ask you this question. What would you say is the most disliked word next to the word no? What word would that be? I know you're thinking at this point here that I have forgot what that word is. But, but really, what would you say the most disliked word beyond the word no really is? The word, what is it? What, it? what really is, are you ready to hear what that word is that is so disliked by so many people? Well, I'll tell you what that word is. That word, are you ready for it? That word is wait. I mean, we really hate to wait on things. Waiting is something that just grinds on us. I'm not talking about the kind of weight that you are gaining while you're in social isolation in terms of the pounds that you're gaining. I'm talking about a weight that has to do with, with time itself. How many of you like to wait? I have to be honest with you. I really dislike waiting. I, I keep thinking that as I get older, I'll become more patient with things and be a better waiter, but I find myself you know, sometimes being even a little bit short, being anxious through this period of isolation and, and social distancing, this waiting thing becomes a really difficult time for almost all of us. And yet life seems to be full of, of waiting. I, when I look at wait, listen, when it comes to waiting, I, and I'm at a grocery store, I'll look for the shortest line. I will look for the fastest line. If it comes down to traffic, I'll take traffic and, and I'll look for the shortest way to one place to another. I'll look for the fastest lane. You know, I just hate to wait. And yet life is full of just a lot of waiting. This might surprise you, but they estimate that most of us spend about 42 to 65 minutes a day waiting on someone or something in a single day. For instance, the other day I found myself at Costco. There I was at Costco and I'm standing in a line that is like several hundred yards long waiting to get into Costco itself. It made me feel as though I was at Disneyland waiting to get on a ride there. And it made me get to think that maybe Costco needs to come up with this idea of a fast pass so you can get in there a little bit quicker. We find ourselves waiting for the light to turn green. We find ourselves waiting at the bank now because you can't go in. And so now you're waiting in a car line to get to a cashier so or so that you can either put money in or take money out. You find yourself waiting. You're waiting at doctor's offices, waiting for the, the nurse to say, okay, the doctor is now ready for you. We find ourselves waiting, looking at our computer as it says, you waiting for a connection and watching the little spool thing go round and round. We find ourselves waiting for so many things in life. Life is just a lot of things that cause us to wait. And so let me ask you this. What are some things that you hate waiting for? Take, for instance, the social isolation and social distancing as we are staying within our own homes. How many times have you said, I bet you have said it at least a hundred times. I've heard it already several times this morning, the words like, I can't wait until we can all be together again. We, we just don't do well with waiting. Now, some people are really good waiters, okay? But most are not all that great when it comes down to, to waiting. We see waiting and time as something that is valuable, almost more valuable than just money itself. It reminds me of a story I read about a, a man who was communicating with God. And so the man asked God, God, what is, like, what is a million years like to you? And God said, well, a million years is like a single second. 
He goes, well, God, what is a million dollars to you? And God says, well, a million dollars is like a penny. So the man says to him, he says, well, God, can you spare a penny? And God said to him, sure, wait a second. And so we find ourselves having to wait. And those are kind of humorous kinds of things, but when it gets down to waiting, sometimes waiting is not a humorous thing. Sometimes waiting becomes really hard. And sometimes waiting becomes extremely painful. Like when you're waiting in a, you know, waiting for a loved one who is undergoing a surgery, that is a long waiting period. Or waiting for test results to, uh, in, to come back in regard to some kind of threatening illness. The other day, Lori and I went into the health center and we took a, a test for COVID-19 to see if we you know, had had the virus or something like that. And so we had to wait. And we had to wait like seven days. Those seven days seemed like a long time. Now, we came back negative, but my point is, is that it was really difficult having to wait through that period of time. Waiting for your company to decide whether they are going to lay you off or whether they are going to retain you, you know, that becomes a long waiting period. Or waiting for your stimulus check to come in. Some people, you know, they're out of work, they're out of jobs, and so they're wondering, when is this stimulus check going to show up? I'm unemployed. When is that my unemployment going to come in? I own a business, small business. When is my stimulus check going to come in for that? And so people find themselves having to wait through a very difficult time. Americans, by nature, are hard workers. We don't want something that is freely given to us. We want to work for that which we, we have. And so we find these periods of time of not having a job or being said that you, know, you can't go to your place of business as a very difficult time. Probably one of the most difficult things to wait on is waiting at the bedside of a person who is dying, your loved one. That can be an excruciating time of, of waiting. And so we find ourselves throughout life waiting. And the thing about waiting is, is that just because you are a Christian doesn't mean that you are exempt from waiting or that you are exempt from the storms of life. Even though we may be faithful in every single way in our lives, we still find ourselves from time to time going through periods of trials, through periods of, of, of tribulation. James, the Lord's brother, says, count all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials. He said when, it's not if, it's, it's just when it's going to happen. All of us find ourselves going through those periods. So we find ourselves saying, wait, wait, wait. I mean, don't you just hate it? The weight of life can weigh us down to the point that we feel worn out, weary. We feel drained like we'll never rise up again. And so we find ourselves in a period of waiting as a world, as a nation, as a community, as a community of believers, we're happy to find ourselves waiting. Listen, good or bad, the truth is this. Most of us are waiting even now for something in our lives. We can look at the coronavirus, but we're also waiting to be back together with family, to see one another. We're waiting to get to back together as a congregation. We're waiting to get back to our jobs and to our workplaces. And we don't know what to do always, but we have no other choice but to wait uh, for the outcome. That's kind of where we are today. But I want you to know something. Waiting is not new for God's people. It's not just a waiting thing in the 21st century, but God's people have been people who have had to wait. Abraham, when he was 75 years old, the angel said to him that you will bear your first son, Isaac. You'll have a son. And then had to wait. It didn't come in nine months. It didn't come in 18 months. It came almost 25 years later. That's a long time to wait. The children of Israel found themselves in captivity for over 400 years. Before they were delivered, they had to wait. Moses, he had to wait 40 years before they could enter into the promised land. Generation after generation of people found themselves waiting on the Messiah for him to show up, for him to, to come. Mary had to wait nine months for the Son of God to be born. So there is a period of waiting, and we find ourselves waiting. We're waiting for the Lord's return so that he can come and get us and so we can go to heaven and be with him forever so that we can enjoy that dwelling place that he has prepared for us. But we have to wait. In the meantime, we wait in tribulation. We wait in trial. We wait through a lot of different things in our lives to see how God is going to move in our lives. 
Even right now, we are waiting to see how is God going to work through this? What is God going to do with all this isolation stuff and this virus and things of that nature? I can tell you this, that God is moving, that there are a lot of incredible things happening because of this very thing. And so God is able to work through all kinds of great things in our lives. And so this morning, what I want to talk to you about is this. I want you to know that God promises, that, that, that God, there are God's promises to those who wait. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 40. On the screen behind me, you see verses 29, but I want to get, begin with verse 28. Listen to what God says. I don't know if you know this or not, but the book of Isaiah is broken into two parts. Some call it book one and book two. Verses one, chapters one through 39 is considered to be the first part of the book. It's all bad news about the sinfulness of Israel and how they're going to go into captivity. From chapter 40 to the end of the book is about how God is going to work in a positive kind of of way. Listen to what he says as he talks about the children of Israel coming back from their punishment because of their sin. Listen to what he says. Do you not know? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength. To the weary and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up on wings of eagles. They will run and not grow get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Those are that's an incredible section of scripture, and and my guess is that probably most of you probably even have it marked in your Bible because of the familiarity of it, and because the hope and the the promises that God has laid out for us as followers of His. So God's people are told to wait on the Lord. That's by the way, if you were to just look at the word wait, you'll find it used over and over and over again as we are encouraged to be still to be silent in our souls, within ourselves, and to trust in in God and to wait. And so God's people are told to wait on the Lord. Those who wait upon the Lord shall be given new strength or renewed strength. You'll mount up like wings of eagles. So what does it mean to wait? Well, to, to wait means, well, it implies trust and hope. In fact, if you were to look at some of your translations, you'll see that some translation says, they who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. Others say, those who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. And so when you talk about waiting, you're talking about waiting with trust, with hope. There is this expectancy that is there for us. Waiting holds an insurance for us that God is going to be with us and that he is going to come through for us. That's the promise that he has given to us. God is going to be there. Even when we are at our weakest, when we feel as though there is no way that we can certainly make it through the hardship or the difficulty or the challenges that we face in life, God's promise is is that I will be with you all the way through this. I'm going to strengthen you. You'll mount up like the wings of eagles. So he uses several analogies. The first analogy is this, is that they who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That's a promise that he has given to us. I want you to dial in on that word renew for just a moment. It's an incredible word when you think of it. God's going to renew a strength within us that will allow us to move on in this life. When you talk about renewal, the idea of renewal is that there is a need that is there. What is the need? Well, the need is for strength. We need a renewal of strength. The idea is is that we've gone through some kind of taxation. We've gone through some difficulty, something that has weighed us down, something that has caused us to become exhausted or to become tired. And so there's a need for renewal, and something has made us empty, and now it needs to be replenished. For instance, you don't take your car to a gas station unless your tank has become empty, empty, and now it needs renewed fuel within it. 
Or maybe you're looking at your refrigerator, ladies, and you're seeing that the milk has gone down, and so you need to go to the store or have someone go to the store for you or have a pickup where you can replenish or renew the milk that is there. That's the idea of this renewal, that there is a loss of strength because of something that has drained us of energy or of power, and so we need that to come into our lives. And so it suggested those who will most delight in this promise of renewal or those who are, have exhausted themselves in some kind of enterprise or have become exhausted because of some kind of trial or some kind of difficulty in life. And so those people are going to rejoice. They're going to be delighted in this promise that God has given to us in, in life. And so spiritual strength is offered to those who are weary. And he used the example of young men. Young men who should have the strength and the stamina and the agility to normally even grow and to to move forward. They become weak. They become fatigued. So he talks about young men. And he talks about young men who are extremely strong. He might be talking about an athlete or he could be talking about a soldier or, or he might be talking about a farmer. He's talking about young men who have lots of stamina, who are able to move forward, who are able to do incredible things. But there is a limit to the human endurance. There is a fatigue that sets in. No matter how young you are, how strong you are, how fit you are, eventually, if the task goes long enough, you're going to get tired. You're going to get weighed down. Endurance just goes away. And so the strongest can only go so far and then no further. They run out of gas. But the promise is this. It's different for those who wait on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord, Isaiah says, will renew their strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Understand that when when we're talking about this, that God is not promising to an extension of our own natural strength here. He's not going to say that he's going to take the physical fatigue away or the weariness away. That's not what, that is not what is on his mind. His idea is that of a renewed strength that helps us to endure life's trials. And so he's talking about a spiritual strength that he is going to give to us that is supernaturally supplied to us. And so when we get down, when we feel weighed down, when the difficulties become hard, when the trials become difficult, when the challenges are there before us, and we feel as though we have, we're worn out, we're fatigued, we're weary, the promise is, is a spiritual strength is on its way that is not supplied by our own selves, but is supplied by God that allows us to get through it. So understand, we're not talking about physical strength here. We're talking about a spiritual strength, an inner strength that's sourced in, in God himself because he cares for us. So the promise is we'll have strength to deal with, the, deal with and meet the trials, the challenges, and difficulties that come our way. Even a coronavirus or social distancing and isolation, such things have a way of sapping our mental and spiritual uh, strength, if you will. And God's promise is this, listen, you will get new strength, strength that will cause you to move forward in life. And then he uses a second analogy or example. There he says, they that wait on the Lord will mount up on wings of eagles. So what does that mean, that we'll mount up on wings of eagles? Well, for those of you who have watched National Geographic or some science show or, or maybe have been witness of eagles in their flight, you have seen how an eagle, without even flapping their wings, can rise to dizzying heights. I mean, almost out of sight, they, they, they go and their source is not within themselves. They don't flap their wings. What they find is they find a source, they find a wind current, they find a, a, an updraft, a thermal updraft that moves them higher as hot air begins to go up into the atmosphere. They catch that current and they're able to ride it all the way up to these huge heights that are up there and they do so without flapping a wing. So what is, what is Isaiah trying to say to us? He's saying not only do we have renewed strength, we mount up on eagles. There is a source that is ours. And so there is a pit that is designed to inspire our spirits. 
It's to lift our, our spirits up, knowing that we're going to be able to mount up, that there's something that's going to happen here. So we will rise above the challenges of life. That's what he's talking about here. That we'll have strength, that there is a promise of being able to rise uh, up on all the challenges that are going to come at us, whatever they might be, that's his promise. So he's promising us to, to enable us to rise above, to soar with an ever-increasing strength beyond ourself, which exceeds reasonable expectations. I mean, it's going to be even amazing or surprising to us. So both analogies, what you see is that we should be exhausted. We should be worn out from everything that's happening around us, but we are, we are not. We shouldn't be able to rise above our difficulties and our challenges, but by God's help, we can do so over and over and over again. It's absolutely amazing because God is going to be with us. That's his promise that he has given to us this morning, and it's our choice. Our choice is that we can flap our wings to absolute exhaustion or we can soar. We can catch on to God's everlasting strength. His current that lifts us above the fray, that lifts us above the challenge, that lifts us above the, the difficulty. I'm not minimizing the difficulties or challenges that you might face. I think that, you know, the coronavirus is something that really weighs us down, but there's a lot of symptoms that comes from that that weigh us down. I'm just telling you that we're going to be able to get through this, and I know you've heard this over and over again, but it's the truth. God is going to be with us in all those things. Those who wait, those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings of eagles. Today, this is the promise that is given to you. And I hope that you will accept it. He says, have you not heard? Have you not seen that the everlasting God does not grow tired? He does not grow weary. He is not like a man. He has all the strength and power that is at our, you know, it's at our hands. We can have it. We can own it. We can claim it. I hope that that's what you will do. I hope that as we go through this isolation period, this distancing period, whatever difficulty that might be coming into our lives because of it, I want to encourage you to trust in him. Trust in him. Hope in him. God is going to be there for us. So I hope that you have been encouraged, encouraged this morning. And not only that, but I want to encourage you that maybe if you are feeling in a down period in your life, spiritually speaking, that you'll take this opportunity to lift up your eyes to he who is able to save you. And if you're not a Christian this morning, will you certainly will you please consider your relationship with God? And if you don't have a relationship with God, why not make that right? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you're willing to confess that fact, that he is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, listen, you can be baptized in the Christ for the remission of your sins. You say, how are you going to do that? Well, listen, social distancing says that at least five people can get together six feet apart, and we have a baptistry that is right behind me. We'll find a way to immerse you into Christ if you're willing to mount up like an eagle. If you're willing to receive new strength from the Lord, the promises there are yours, and they're there forever. Uh, please consider these things. Listen to this song as one of encouragement.